right, I'm going to call the City Ground Committee the whole meeting for Monday, October 23rd, 2017 to order. Clerk Patrick, please call the roll. Present are Mayor Keith Hedrick, Deputy Mayor Lawrence Garish, Councilors Jill Rusk, Jamal Beckford, Stephen Sheffield, Conrad Heath, Rashad Carter, Finance Director Ron Uhas, Clerk Deborah Patrick. Okay. Um, to move everybody, I'm going to move a couple things around in order to get the guests, get to the guests first. The first one we'll do is 653, which is a themed River Heritage Park donation request. And uh, Marion Galbraith is here for to represent uh, James River Heritage Park. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here with you again. Um, I'm here as the president of the Thames River Heritage Park Board Foundation, Foundation Board um, to give you a, a review. We're in the process of do, putting together our end of the year annual report and you'll get a copy of that when it's ready. But for now, I'll give you some of the highlights. We had a very nice successful year. Uh, we increased our ridership by 38% over last year. We had hoped to have 2,000 riders this year. And we had 2,179, which so we exceeded our own expectations, which was really great. Um, and overall received 4.8 stars out of five stars rating on our surveys. So that was, uh, that was pretty good. So let me just tell you a little bit about some of the highlights. This year we were named by Yankee Magazine, which covers New England, uh, the best historical experience in New England. Um, we had an article in the July issue of Connecticut Magazine. We had 10 releases uh, out to dozens of local and regional publications, two positive editorial pieces on the Thames River Heritage Park and Nautilus Dock project in the day, three articles in The Resident, and two radio reviews. We also were on television programs and made over 30 presentations to different organizations. Um, socially, we averaged two posts a day between May 1st and September 17th, um, and our Facebook uh, likes grew by another 30 percent um, the top post not unsurprising in our community was of a sub passing the uh, the water taxi that was the very past with uh, with 9625 uh, re with the 9625 reach and 3934 views we had 23,000 impressions on um, on Twitter uh, for the, I, I'll, I have lots of statistics on marketing, which is probably not the big thing you want to read about, but, but we had some great outreach, and because of that outreach, we ended up with a really good ridership, and one of our ambassadors is here, Jane is here, she's a, one of our ambassadors and helped us do um, some of the um, surveys that we did at the end of the year, but the surveys at the end of the year were very positive, and interestingly enough, um, out of the people who responded, the town that had the largest number of people riding the water taxis, Groton. Um, not, not much more, more than New London, but a little bit, edges out New London. But, um, but we did 125 surveys re uh, representing 320 riders, um, and almost half of them came from places outside of our two towns, of New London and Groton. So we are drawing people here, which was very, very important to us. Most people are hearing about us um, from word of mouth um, and uh, print ads. Um, the day is a very popular place, source of information, and Facebook. We do have partners um, in our organization, and within those partners um, are the day. The day gives us um, $10,000 worth of marketing for free. Hall Communications does the same as does Atlantic Broadband. So that's pretty good free coverage, and that covered lots and lots of ads, lots and lots of radio and television ads as well. Um, so in terms of our ridership, I mentioned that we had 2,179 people. Um, the biggest weekends were weekends where there were major events, Sailfest and um, the Connecticut Maritime Heritage Festival. So we had for Connecticut Maritime Heritage Festival over 400 riders that weekend, which was enormous for us, simply enormous. Uh, we ran two water taxis all day long. Um, all, the, all, the, all of them packed, and that, by the way, does not even count the people from the coal because we gave them free rides, anybody who was on the coal. Um, so it, 
pointed out something to us about the importance of events in the area. One of the recommendations that we will be making in our report is that we try to get some events established on the Groton side. So to that end, um, we're going to try to do, um, we're, we're having an initial meeting this Saturday to try to pull together the organizations on Groton Bank to do a kind of welcome to Groton Bank kickoff early in the season. Uh, this would include the Ebenezer Avery House, the Bill Memorial Library, the Friends of Fort Griswold. Um, we'd, we'd like to be able to use the Mother Bailey if we can. Um, and we also have paid for uh, four walking tours, historic walking tours to be done of the Groton Bank area. So over the winter, those will be put onto an app so that people can listen to them and access them um, re on, you know, on their electronic devices. One is on whaling, one is on the revolution, one is on just the development of Groton Bank, and the other, uh, skipping my mind completely, I'll, <laughs> it'll come to me. Uh, but we have four of them that we're developing, and uh, they've all been tested, and um, they're, they're working well. So um, that's kind of a broad overview. Uh, I'll tell you about our financial status. Uh, you know, we, we ended up in the black. The, the water taxi did not, but with the contributions that we had, obviously we have to be in the black. We can't spend any more than we have. Um, but even from what we had from last year remaining, we were still in the black, which is a pretty good place for us to be. However, that being said, we pared down our budget to pretty much just the water taxi and a minimum amount of marketing. What we really need to do now is market outside of the Groton area. If we're going to be pulling people in, we have to market outside. Now, one of the things we did this year was we did, um, for three days, we did surveys up at the Nautilus, because one of the things we want to do is put in a dock at the Nautilus. Now, that has been approved by the Connecticut Port Authority. The funding for it has been approved. Has to go next go before the Bond Commission, and we've all had experience with how long that can take. Uh, but anyway, uh, hopefully when a budget is passed, we'll get through the Bond Commission. So we did interviews with, uh, we did 109 um, interviews uh, representing over 500 people. And um, we found out overwhelmingly that people would ride the water taxi. And the things that they would ride the water taxi to do are, and this might inform you in terms of economic development, they would ride it to go get lunch. <laughs> uh, they would ride it to go get lunch and shop. So right now, the biggest opportunities for that are in New London, but it's, it's something to think about for economic development here. People really like the idea of being able to park their car at the Nautilus and then spend the day doing things. They gave us a price point, $20, was it 15 to $20 was the price point that they thought they would pay to do this whole water taxi loop. And we envision it as working kind of like it works in Baltimore. Uh, where you get one water taxi ticket that kind of takes you in a loop, but if you want to go to Fort McHenry, you got to pay extra. So that's kind of what we would do for the Nautilus, and we hope and anticipating having that dock ready for the time that the U.S. Coast Guard Museum um, comes online so that we can capture that crowd, because a new museum is going to be the most popular draw, and if we can capture that crowd and get them over the Nautilus and get them over to here, that's going to be good news for us. Um, so it was a successful year. In a little while, you're going to hear from Wendy Berry. Um, and I had given to, um, to Keith to give to you some of the report that they gave. And part of the report they gave about arts and economic develop development included a calculator to figure out if an organization spends X number of dollars, what does that calculate for in terms of jobs? What does that calculate in terms of um, household income that's generated out of those tourism, out of the, the money that's being spent there? So just using a rough, cal just using that formula, uh, we calculated that the, um, the money that we spent this year would have created 5.81 full-time equivalent jobs, household income of $107,227.12, which would have generated then in local and state taxes, well, the local $2,347.41 and state $5,683.47. So even in its infancy, it's uh, a benefit to our community. We hope you'll reconsider or, or consider giving us, um, once again, donating 10,000. We're making the same 
asked to each of the municipalities. We have asked the state for $100,000 for each of the two years. Um, it came out of the budget early this week, but it went back uh, early last week, but it went back in the budget on Friday. So it's still in the budget, in the state budget. We still have our fingers crossed. Um, uh, sh I, I have to give a shout out to uh, Paul Formica for responding instantly when, uh, when I called him, um, which was really great. He, he managed to get that back in for us by talking to the Senate leader for the Republicans. So questions? Anyone? Okay, then I'll take a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting of uh, the 6th of November. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank Mary. you very much for your time and thank you, Keith, for thank your you. efforts on the board. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks. Okay, the next agenda item is 654 of South Eastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition with Wendy Berry. I, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize, everyone, because Wendy had an expectation of being able to do a uh, an electronic presentation, and That's I was on. Un I imagine I'm in I the air, so we like pictures. <laughs> I was un I was unaware of that. So, so but, but Wendy's going to get us started here, and we have some so information like, with you. And I'll pass this out afterwards. <laughs> yep. So, so if you want to hold on to that until I, until I I'll okay. walk you through that in a little bit, and I'm not going to see you can't see this, but just. If, what I wanted to do was tell you a little bit about our organization in case you haven't heard of us before, and then walk you through some of these results that we had with the study and where this study came from. So just so you know, we were formed in 2014. Uh, we were, the South Asian Connecticut Cultural Coalition was formed out of a need in the region from two assessment reports that were done, one in Norwich and one in New London, that found that this region needed a regional uh, larger than just each city. Uh, Club the Cultural Arts Alliance to, um, to serve as one of the statewide um, reg regional service organizations. So we are part of one of nine um, agencies that across the state, we all work together, the nine of us, underneath the Office of the Arts, underneath DECD. Um, so we're an independent nonprofit, but we do have a mandate to provide services to this region for the Office of the Arts. When we do get grants, right now that grant is up in the air, we will still provide those services for the Office of the Arts with, with or without the grant. Um, so we are one of the field offices for the Office of the Arts. Our role really is to be the voice of the cultural sector, the creative economy. We are the liaison between the cultural sector and leadership entities invested in regional revitalization, <coughs> municipal, community, business, education, tribal, military, and tourism sectors. So we have a diverse group of partners. We are at this point, so we launched in 2014, we're, so we're not even four years old yet. We have 525 registered partners within the coalition. You would have been able to see a really cool graph with all <laughs> who our partners are. But just so you know, about 25% of our partners are individual artists, 21% are creative businesses, um, performing arts organizations, museums, art centers, uh, foundations, municipalities, economic development commissions, the libraries, and social service agencies with arts-based programs. So we really have a diverse group, or truly a diverse coalition. In, in Groton Line, we have 60 partners. Um, so actually, uh, I'll pull it out. We actually brought you a list of the 60 partners, I'm sorry, 58 partners that are here in Groton, both town and city. Um, so it's a big chunk. It's 11% of our total partnership comes from Groton alone. 55% of our partners are for profit. So while we serve nonprofits that are there, definitely in need right now uh, with the state budget situation, uh, the 55%, the majority, has always been for-profit businesses. So what do we do? Well, our kind of core values within the organization are to connect, collaborate, and communicate. Pretty simple, uh, but actually when you're working regionally, not so easy to connect, collaborate, and communicate. Uh, so in the beginning, when we first launched, our first role of connecting was to bring together those of like minds, like missions, like organizations. So we run roundtables for museum directors. They meet quarterly. Art centers, performing arts centers, they all meet individually and across the region. Historical societies had never come together in the same room before from across the region. Performing arts centers had never come together in the same room before. Um, so we have five, that we, five round tables, museum directors, historical societies, and historic sites, performing visual arts centers, arts and health, which are the social service agencies that have arts-based programs. And the, we also run a new London round table that's slowly creeping to become the Thames River uh, a round table. That's a diverse group of business and community leaders. 
we um, collaborate by increasing awareness amongst those partners so they can actually learn each other's hours and programs and products and services and needs and events. Um, so they work together just to increase their own, if we're going to work together, let's know about what we, what we do. Um, they also have started to do collaborative grant writing. They do collaborative projects together. We spearhead, we administer, we organize, we lead, uh, but they do the work. Uh, they've done and received some grants. A few of the smaller groups have received some grants, and then they helped us to identify vital issues across this region for our sector. Um, and then we take all this information, which is kind of the boots in the ground information, and we distribute it. We make sure we connect the dots across the region. We're advocating in Hartford quite a bit right now. We're on phone calls also with legislators, making sure they hear um, information about this region particularly. We are involved with sector to make sure that the arts and culture were in the SEDS, making sure that uh, we talk to municipalities about making sure arts and culture are in your POCDs. Uh, we offer tools and resources to help anything from having a poet laureate in your city to um, what the different economic development strategies are. We communicate out with our partners regularly. Um, so we're, uh, gosh, in every almost economic development agency, uh, information sharing, and then a lot of cross-sector partnerships. How can we work with manufacturing? How can we work with biosciences? How can the creative kind of force behind everything be part of this economy as a whole, but also at the team? Uh, some of the projects that we've done just recently, we a couple years ago, we did the Historic Houses of Southeastern Connecticut which was a collaborative of 18 different historic house museums that just created a brochure, something as simple as a brochure. If one person loves history, they're going to want to send them down the road to the next history organization. That was a successful project. Performing Arts, we brought together 19 performing arts organizations. They actually put on a show. It was like a variety show where you had a little dancing, a little of this, a little bit of that, um, up in Norwich at, at Slater. Um, and they also did a brochure with 20,000 brochures put out. Um, with a total of 24 organizations so that people could really find out where they could go and what was going on in all these different, so from Krause and the Goodspeed to Eugene O'Neill to the Guard, um, all involved in that project. We recently finished uh, an employee, uh, employee survey and focus group with Electric Boat to learn more about what new employees want in terms of arts and culture in the region and how we can help retain that and how we can be part of that. Uh, we work with Millennium Public Schools right now with the soup well, former superintendent, um, and a group with the Community Foundation. We have a directory. Um, we helped to establish the Poet Laureate in the city of Norwich just recently. And just last week, we're now working with the town of Griswold and their EDC in a project plan um, to bring a whole mural project into the city and expand it into kind of addressing social issues um, and something bigger than just murals. So we do a lot of work, but we're a toolbox for you as well. So. Um, a couple just quick things about um, some data uh, about arts and culture and creativity being essential to communities. Really essential to tourism, to education, quality of life, the economy, skilled workforce, and healthcare. And a couple of factoids um, that we can send you as well. Students that are involved in arts, program, in arts programs are three times more likely to be recognized for academic achievement, for high attendance, and for participation in a math or science fair. Students involved in arts programs are 44% less likely to do drugs. And so after school programs are often provided by these arts and cultural organizations in your community. For enrichment programs, summer camps, and after school programs. In terms of tourism, and we'll have some numbers in a minute, uh, if you look at any tourism ad from the state of Connecticut, it's still revolutionary, but primarily, and we have a couple examples, if you look at all the ads that are in New York and Boston, it's featuring the arts and cultural organizations. Uh, so tourism dollars do not go to arts and cultural organizations. Uh, we always try to make that clear. A tourism dollar goes to state of Connecticut marketing ads and buys, not to the arts and cultural organizations. So they're two separate things. Um, and But really, truly, we are if without the arts and cultural organizations, we would have a lot less to promote in the state. Healthcare. 50% uh, of the hospitals in the United States actually have arts programming, and that's growing every year. Uh, communities with a high concentration of arts in them have higher civic involvement, higher child welfare, more social cohesion, lower crime, and lower poverty rates. This is all that. Skilled, right. Skilled workforce, creativity is the fuel that drives the innovation. We know that communities with thriving arts and cultural assets attract and retain economic investment, new businesses, and skilled workers. We know firsthand from the electric boat survey that young workers want a rich and diverse arts and cultural menu of options. And they want a walkable, they want all the things, but they definitely want a thriving arts and cultural center where they live. So in terms of the economy, what Mary and what the mayor of was referring to was a study that we just released a couple weeks ago called the Arts and Economic Prosperity. 
We were one of 341 regions in the United States that participated in this study. It is a baseline for this region. Uh, we've never had this kind of study before. It was a study of just the nonprofits in New London County. Um, and so 70 organizations participated in this study, which was a 31% participation rate, so it actually would be higher. Uh, it had audience interest up surveys, and it was groundbreaking for us. So the total economic impact of the nonprofit arts and cultural organizations here, those 70 in New London County, is 168 million. I'll give you a little context for that in a minute. But the 168 million is made up of about half, 87 million, from the organization spending themselves, and the other 81 million is in their audience spending. It supports nearly 4,500 jobs in the region, full-time equivalency. And those 70 organizations return and generate 10.5 million in state and local revenue, um, government revenue. So for us, we know that we get about 1.2, 1.1 to 1.3 million in direct kind of money from the state. We used to, I'm not sure about this year. Um, returning 10.5, statewide it's about $80 million in return on investment from the state for about a $5 million investment. So a huge return on investment. So the coolest thing you could have seen here was Putting our little region into perspective, uh, here, this would be Vermont with a population of 626,000 at $123 million. Delaware, the entire state of Delaware, $150 million in economic impact for almost a million population. The entire state of Maine, $151 million for a population of 1.3, and their, one of their primary um, you know, industries is tourism. And look at us, bigger than all three individual states, plus another state, Wisconsin. Right? So we're actually in our little tiny county, bigger than three individual states in New England. This was great for us to finally have a piece of data um, that really shows the, the robustness. We are one-fifth of the state's economic impact, just from this county alone. Um, this gave us true, um, for us to know that this corner really punches above our weight, we finally have data on it. 21% of the state's total economic activity comes from this county alone. 3.2 million attendees just in 2015 for those 70 organizations. That's a much bigger number than most people often kind of put with arts and cultural organizations. 66% um, of those attendees um, are from the local area, from the county. So tourism is a huge part, <coughs> but the residents provide the base. So really what we know from the study was that the locals help retain those local dollars because 66% of those attendees, um, I'm sorry, 55% 50, 50, of those attendees local attendees would have traveled to a different location to go to an arts and cultural event if it wasn't located here, specifically the one they attended. So we love our locals because they're, they're bread and butter, but they also um, uh, would have taken those dollars someplace else. But our tourists that come in, 78% of those tourists that came in said they specifically came for that arts and cultural event. And, and they spend 133% more. So we love our locals, we love our tourists. Um, and that's just, we have a breakdown of where they spend the money, just like Marion said, they're gonna go eat, they're gonna go sleep, they're gonna go get some gas, some souvenirs, some clothing, some transportation, parking. Um, and so um, I'm gonna put, kind of refer to this now, but really the essence of this whole report uh, was really the arts mean business, and that arts, and we tried to remind people at our presentation last week or two weeks ago, um, while this is great economic data and great numbers, Arts themselves really are food for the soul. We go back to the real purpose of the arts, which is creativity and self-expression and, and all of the in innovation. Um, but truly, now we finally have some numbers. So this is the takeaway for you all to have in terms of just the, you make it really easy <laughs> in terms of graphs. And then if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts in terms of methodology, this is the 30-page report with all of the data that gets into demographics about the population, the numbers, um, the economic impact calculator that can be given to any nonprofit organization in this region. Uh, they can use that same calculator and determine their own economic impact. Um, and it has a lot more data in there. So for us, we're going to we kind of take this show on the road for a while. Um, and we're kind of just making sure that every town and municipality knows that we are here as your toolbox. If there's things and projects you all have in your pipeline that are arts and cultural centric, we want to be part of those and be the wind in those sails. And that's what we're here for. Any questions? Anyone? Uh, Councilor Sheffield? Hi, gr great presentation. It's um, much better when it's on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Now, where are you centrally located? What's the uh, your main office? Or yeah, so we now have our offices up in Norwich. Okay. So we're in a co-work space in Boundary 66 with NCDC. Um, and then we have donated space <coughs> in New London that we use when we need it. And are you looking for space here in Groton now, or? We've actually talked with a few places who we're looking to. We're looking to, the most important thing for us is that we're actually in a building with people who are working similarly with us. That it's who our neighbors are. Um, so we've talked with Sector um, to see if there was a possible, when, uh, if they were gonna go up, there's a space upstairs, it's just not handicap accessible. So that for us was a, was a deal breaker. Um, and then we've talked with, um, we were looking, talking to the tourism district before they uh, closed up shop to see where they were gonna move. But it's most important that we actually are really in an economic development wheelhouse um, and that we are situated with people who understand what we're trying to do regionally um, and that we are working together as a team. So that's what we're looking for is to go into a place. And, and the co work space in Norwich works great. It's a lot of small creative businesses that are starting, so we're finding partners there. But it's, um, we'd love to be in a space that actually does have um, broader mind, you know, in terms of regional coverage. Anyone else? Okay. Wendy, thank you very You're much. Very I apologize for the. No, no problem. No problem. Hey, we're going to go to 640, which is the Grab Municipal Employees Federal Credit Union. You probably don't have anything there. It's okay. Uh, good evening, Council. So I'm just here to give you a very quick update on uh, where we're at with the uh, radon um, mediation. Uh, we have the inst we have the uh, piping installed. The fan is running. Um, we feel as of today that uh, we are we have met the uh, EPA's standards of below four picocuries. I want to remind you that we started with as high as 9.2 um, picocuries uh, on there, and uh, so after a 70-hour test last week, we're down to an average of 1.6 picocuries, and four is the national level uh, uh, of that. And um, we came in under budget, and we have submitted our invoice to. to um, the credit union for their half of the contribution to put this in. So that was the update on that. It's working. Any questions or comments on this? Councilor Rusk. I just want to say thank you for getting it done um, and for coming under budget. That's even a bonus. So thank you. <laughs> Very good. Okay, while you're there, <clears throat> we're going to go to 655, which is department presentations. Uh, Carlton recently went to a uh, uh, seminar, I'm not exactly sure what it's called, but one of the recommendations from uh, one of the citizens was when we send, when I send department heads to different events for training or whatever, to have them come back and report out. So one of the things that we're going to start is we'll have department heads come in. It's good to report out to you guys so you know where they went, what they're doing to, to keep her skills on, keep her skills owned, and it also lets the uh, the general public know where their money's being spent. So with that, Carlton, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So um, this year's national conference, it's, it's called the ICC International Code Council uh, Conference, was held in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it was uh, September 10th through the 13th. And uh, there are training days on there. This will kind of tag along with the arts community. We're learning of what, of what the uh, next uh, person that may be taking my job or, or other jobs are coming into the workforce. So what we're learning uh, at the same time that the information you just heard is, is how they want to live and how are we going to make this resiliency uh, happen uh, in here. And uh, they've with the population and the, the demographics that we know, we've learned that they like living in pods. They like all living into the same little cubicle area. So we're going to uh, build codes. What, we, what this conference does is gets to, once we get all that information together, we start developing codes for the future. This code will be the 2021 that comes out where we're learning that um, we'll build these cement structures, high rise structures with elevators in the center and these pods can slide in 
uh, into the center of these pieces, come in and you'll, be, you'll go up the elevator and you'll come into your unit. The, the resiliency portion of this is that as workforce moves around the country, and this is why it's a national conference, is that we can take these pods, slide them out, and move them to another place in the country and slide them in to the exact same holder, basically, that could be built here or in California. So it's very important that we develop codes that are national standards uh, on there. We put them on trains and, and move them across the country to, to where the workforce is uh, on there. We, um, we had, I, had, I, not we, but I attended classes, and these are class, basically, plans. You'll, one day you learn about what's, what you're supposed to be looking for in the plans, and the next day, your practice plan, you have to go in and pass what's wrong with the plan compared to what you learned the, the day before. Uh, you get certificates. You'll see that we, uh, certificate of completion of that class after uh, nine hours of uh, training on there. Um, and I, uh, one of the uh, bigger pieces this year, which uh, was that Connecticut, for the first time uh, ever, had won the uh, Chapter of the Year Award um, and for, the, for the United States. On there. I've been on the board, I was a president, I've been a board member for 10 years of this Connecticut Building Officials Association, and uh, this accumulation of work that we've all done as a, as a group has got us the national award. Uh, it has some little bit of benefits to it, so we get to send an extra person next year to the, to the uh, ICC conference and we gain an extra chapter day. They do free, two free trainings a year uh, when you win that award. Any, any questions or comments on that? Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Carl. Okay, the next line item is, or next item is 656, award contract for POCD to plan a metrics. Barbara, I'll let you. I'm sorry, you digressed. I did? No, we did. Oh, we did, okay, that's good. What was it, man? Good. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Barbara. The POCD is an acronym for the Plan of Conservation and Development. It's a, ten, a document that's required by state statute to be created and then updated every 10 years. We've had them going back to the 80s, and um, it's time for us to, we have a 2008, so clearly we have to do one for 2018. So um, this is the, for, um, discretionary grants at the state, they're going to um, make sure you have a valid POCD. So it does have um, a fiscal impact on the city if we do not um, update it and approve it. So we um, put out a request for proposal from firms. We got only one response. Luckily it was by um, a known consultant, I, uh, Glenn Chalder, I think maybe some of you are familiar with his work. He came in and did the um, zoning reg rights for the Planning and Zoning Commission, and he also did our 2008 POCD. Um, we had limited funds, and I think that we had, I had a lot of calls, but I think the limited um, scope that we could pay for turned off a lot of the um, um, potential bidders, but Glenn Chalder, because he was working with the document that he created in 2008, which was a substantial uh, redo of our POCD, um, really is pretty much um, pretty consistent with where we want it, where we see ourselves growing from here, if you will. It's a really good vision statement of where we want to do, where we want to go, and how we want to develop. And um, what he's going to go through is do the things we've already completed. There's a lot of the recommendations in that report that have been done by the Planning um, and Zoning Commission. And so he's going to update it and make it more current, reflect current state statutes and some current thinking on climate change. I'd like to do some coastal resiliency work because I think we need it. And um, that puts us in a better position of, of prepping for future um, storms like Sandy and Irene that we had. Um, that's it. Um, if there's any questions, I've been say oh, but from from a monetary standpoint, I've been trying to put some money aside for a couple of years in my budget as long as I can, and that's been held in reserve. Um, so we have almost all that the um, contract is for. And I have a resolution to go before the council for if you so choose. Questions or comments from Barbara? Councilor Reed? 
Um, are you saying that a report is ready or a report is in process or uh, where, where do we stand on this? The proposal just came in and we're going to go with the one legitimate proposal that was for the, enough for the amount of money that okay. we have and or could put together. And so he will begin work He's already begun. We've already met with the town. We're getting some free um, mapping services, which is really helpful for us. And he's already started. And the first kickoff will probably be a, like a public visioning session where people will come in and he puts around the room different prouds and sorries. You take different colored sticky um, dots and you put them on things that you're proud of, that you're sorry for, you, things you like about the city, things you'd like to see changed or improved. And that's the kickoff that gets people thinking about where they live and what they where they'd like what they'd like it to reflect, <coughs> and then he takes it from there when he does his um, when he starts his work. Any other questions or comments from Barbara? Okay, I need a motion to move this to the council meeting of uh, November sixth. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, I need a motion to add an item to the agenda, which is the grant approval for DUI enforcement. I'll make a second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. Uh, what number would that be? Uh, yes. This would be, well, I don't know. Well, our last one is that. Let's we'll see what we got. The last one is 659, so we'll go ahead and make this 660. Uh, abstentions? No. Favors? Abstentions? Okay. Motion carries you now. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chief? Good evening. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I bear good news. We have a uh, grant approval confirmation. Uh, it is a federal grant uh, through the uh, Connecticut Department of Transportation for DWI enforcement. It is for $9,700 and uh, it will be a full fringe uh, funded 100% grant. Uh, so it will be uh, all money going exclusively to the city of Rotten. Uh, would give good correct great credit here to Julia Parker and Ron Umas working on this uh, and uh, facilitating and seeing it through the process. Uh, we have uh, targeted areas within the city uh, uh, where we've had at, uh, injury accidents, uh, DWI, uh, Clarence B. Sharp, Bridge, Thames, Mitchell, and Rainville uh, in particular. Our time frame is shown Saturdays at 3 a.m., which is unusual uh, as uh, the, the time period that we've had uh, our most uh, significant head injury accidents. Uh, this program has been <coughs> quite successful. Uh, uh, we've had no al uh, alcohol related fat uh, fatalities within the city of Groton. Our, our injury index rate has stayed uh, uh, fairly static. Uh, our DWI arrests are down, but our alcohol related crashes are uh, down significantly. So, uh, this uh, directed type of enforcement uh, done during uh, holiday periods where uh, uh, we we're prone to have these incidents. Uh, definitely works and uh, and it's uh, the lab officers out there working and uh, hopefully we uh, can get another year without a fatality and, uh, and continue to cut our accident index rate any questions or comments for the chief mm -hmm. chief will, will you be will that just be random patrols or will you have any spot checks these will be roving patrols and uh, uh, they will be targeted in, in, into areas that statistically mm -hmm. we've shown that uh, uh, we've had issues, and uh, and we look at that not only uh, uh, will we hit the problem area where we during the time frame that we've had the had problems, but we also look at it as the deterrent effect. Um, you know, you don't, as you know, Chief, you don't always come home with a uh, with the DWI arrest, but uh, they sometimes, definitely know we're out there. Sometimes other things. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments for the chief? Okay. Uh, I need a motion to add this to the mayor and council meeting of. Uh, November the 6th. I'll make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate it.
that's six seven. Uh, <coughs> we're going to go to 658 proposed water white water rate revisions. Yeah. Well, I realize I realize I'm jumping around, but I'm, there's a reason because we're going to save the stuff that is just for us to last. That way, we don't hold people longer than necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Collins. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I think everybody, if everybody doesn't know who I'm in, I'm David Collard. I'm the uh, financial manager from the uh, utility department. And uh, what I've uh, handed out to you is uh, some of the work that we've done uh, to create uh, the rates necessary to support the new water treatment plant. Um, some of you haven't seen this before because you're new to the, to the council. And, uh, <coughs> but I'll go through uh, basically the philosophy of it. Uh, in continuing to evaluate revenue requirements that support current and future infrastructure requirements and ensure long-term financial integrity to provide for adequate operations and maintenance costs, a 10-year projection was produced and previously presented to both the Utilities Commission and the City Council. The 10-year projection contained a proposal for a series of rate increases. The original projection has been updated to include a water treatment plant upgrade with a new total cost of $54 million funded by a loan from the state of Connecticut, um, DWSRF, with own, which will be offset by $15 million grant and from the Department of Health. Uh, that service for the plant upgrade does not begin until one year after the construction is completed. Accordingly, rate increases were um, Rates were increased 2.6% in July 1, 2015, and 6.2% 7 1 16 to continue to provide for future capital needs. A total of $1.1 million has been contributed to a water treatment plant restricted fund to date. Um, the second phase of the increases is proposed to take effective on January 1, 2018 at 4%, followed by two successive 4% increases to take effect July 1, 2018 and July 1, 2019. These increases together with the initial 15, 2015 and 16 increases will further support current and future infrastructure requirements and will add over $3.5 million to the water treatment plant restricted fund over the next three years to provide for adequate debt service funding of the water treatment plant and ensure long-term financial integrity. It's recommended that once the plant upgrade is well under construction, the services of the financial consultant that prepared the cost of service study in 2010 be retained to analyze the project cost impact and budget requirement to design rates to satisfy the overall revenue sufficiency for the water division. So the first sheet that you have before you is the uh, projection out through 2016 showing the <coughs> increases here for 2018, 19, and 20. Um, beyond that is uh, just a, uh, an example of what could possibly be what the, uh, the uh, percentage increases might be in order to continue providing the um, revenue sufficiency for the water division. Um, that will depend on future plans for other types of capital improvements as well as the, the uh, ending cost of the uh, water treatment plant, which could be less than the $54 million that was estimated it to be therefore reducing the overall debt service costs, interest rates, and interest costs, and so forth. 
Um, the second page that you have is a white implementation schedule. This kind of mirrors what was in the um, newspaper recently for the rate hearing that the Utility Commission had, and that shows you an example of the, a typical 800 cubic foot bill and what the, what the revenue would cost annually, uh, what the uh, cost of the water would be annually um, with those increases. And the third uh, page, which is a graph comparing our, the water bill of 800 cubic feet annually uh, to uh, area water companies. And at the uh, end of 2002, I'm sorry, 2020, when the last 4% increase goes in, it shows what that would be $643 annually in comparison to the other, it show also shows you where it is today at 572 annually. Yes. So <clears throat> these, um, the comparison, um, these are the groups that's today, right? The, the first one, it says July 1, 2017. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. I just mean when we're looking at like Aquarian or... Oh, everybody like else's is current rates. Gotcha. Yeah. Is it, is it safe to say that they go up 3% usually per year? What you mean for the others? You're right. I don't know. You don't know. Okay. In the past, we've talked about we think an assumption would be that they would go up some amount in the future. We don't know how much that would be, but that's still, even at 643, that puts us with competitive rates. Right, right. I'm just saying, like, you know, I just did some quick math. If right. I looked at the 617 number, yeah. right, 3%. Every year, you end up with three, uh, 675, yep. um, which is competitive, I right. think, with where we end up in 2020. Absolutely. So that, that's all I'm trying to oh, understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Yep, you're right. Something else, uh, we had a public hearing on this last week, and then the Rotten Utilities Commission uh, met and voted on it, and that's why it's here to you guys today. Councilor Heath. Just a couple of clarifications here. Um, on the first page, Line two, it says other revenue. The first year is five hundred twenty-five thousand, and then the next eight years are all at four fifty-two. Um, why would those all be the same? Actually, I don't remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> there is a reason for it. Uh, it it uh, it's been a while since I. Is that the Legend Service contract? No, no, that's not what that is. That I, I don't remember. I could get back to you on that. Sure. And then, just so I understand, down at number 11, it says total system surplus deficit. There's a 1.221 million 524 for, for fiscal year 2017. And then, surplus as you go across rate. the page, it, you see a few numbers in ne um, parentheses, which usually means negative. But when you get down, when you get down past 2021, you are starting to utilize the cash that you build up. That this is the activity from the operations of that fiscal year. So the activity for that fiscal year shows negative. And so you're at that point you're mm -hmm. going to start to be utilizing the funds that you're putting aside gotcha. now and doing the rate increases now softens the impact mm -hmm. to the customer at the end of the project being completed without having to put large increases in place. Right. Correct. Okay. Uh, I remember when we talked about this uh, quite a while ago that that was the intent was to gradually uh, uh, put this money like in like in the capital so yes. that we wouldn't get hit with a big expense all at once. Exactly. And that's <coughs> what we're doing with this on an annual right. basis and putting the money into a restricted fund. Okay. Uh, Councilor Sheffield. Um, yes. Uh, David, you anticipate, I guess, fiscal year 2021 to 2026 will be 2% increase for those five years? That's that a the number that we put in there for, as an example. We were trying to, to uh, you, uh, have valid uh, metrics down on the bottom, the, the total debt service coverage and the day's cash on hand. You'll notice the, red, the green check mark means that that's a good quality day's mm -hmm. cash on hand 
based on the target of 120. The, uh, the target for the debt service coverage is 1.25, and it starts to fall below the 1.25 because of the fact that um, there is a negative cash, a deficit cash coming in, and you will be starting to utilize some of the savings that have been put aside for it. Any other questions? Okay, I'll need a motion to, excuse me, to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting of uh, 6 November. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimous. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you, David. Okay, we're going to go to 659 Mutual Aid. We'll talk about the Utilities Department. Randy, do you want to yeah. share? Short so on October 8th at 5 a.m. we met at the Groton Utilities Operations Building. Mayor uh, Hendrick, uh, Ron Gaudet, uh, Don Rinaldi, myself, Len Beebe, who is the union uh, vice president right now, and the staff that was going down to um, Fort Lauderdale. It took them uh, from Sunday, Monday, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, they traveled down to about three days with a caravan of about five trucks. They partnered up with Norwich Public Utilities, Taunton Mass, and I believe one other, um, I don't know if it was from Chicopee or Holyoke, and they drove down the caravan. The trucks are big. They weigh about 26,000 pounds, so they probably drove about 55, average probably 45, 50 miles per hour mm -hmm. the whole way down and, and uh, stopped. They drove about 11, 11 hours a day. I think they were restricted by their CEO. They um, loaded the trucks, I believe, on the 11th. Um, the barge left on the 12th. It took about five days or so to get to the Virgin Islands. So those guys left on Friday, got there Friday, and had to wait two or three days for their trucks to get there. So they started walking around and surveying the islands, et cetera. So they've been down there about two weeks now, this past Sunday. Um, so they've been working about eight days straight. They've been working uh, seven days a week about 14 hours a day mm. since they got there. It's hot, <laughs> it's muggy, it's gross. Um, they seem happy. <laughs> <laughs> from what we hear, we're not getting a lot of response from them. Um, communication is still not very good there. They had um, Verizon phones from here, and they don't work very well on the island, so they actually got new SIM cards in Fort Lauderdale, switched over to AT&T, and I guess you know it's still kind of spotty and whatnot. Um, there were 30. 33 linemen that went down, two mechanics, about six or seven managers from the NEPA mutual aid um, organization. And they're looking to bring down um, more, they want another 12 to 15 crews of two or three, um, more buckets and more diggers to put poles up. And, and um, so the pictures you have in front of you, that first picture on the grouping is actually the barge they stayed on. Um, they were on there for a couple of days and then they brought down a decommissioned uh, cruise ship. So they're now two to a room with showers. They've got laundry coming uh, nice. once a week on a Thursday. They take their clothes and put them on their bed, and they take the sheets and the clothes and wash them. My understanding is the day, the clothes that you wear for that day are pretty much disgusting and gross. So they're planning about 10 days of, of wear, and then they get washed. So they're trying to get two times a week laundry, but right now it's one. Um, there's like a buffet for dinner. My understanding is that five, 5.30, they serve breakfast at 5.45. You have to get on the bus, or the shuttle, to get to the cars and stuff. So they got pretty pretty, uh, pretty busy days. So from 5-ish five, five probably in the morning till probably 7, 7 or so at night they're working. And then there's a couple roads that are really high traffic. Um, so we can go through the pictures real quick. The second picture, they just sent that uh, today, um, or actually a couple days ago. That was, uh, that's a, it looks like either a cat bank or a recloser that's just demolished on the ground. Uh, the third picture looks like a um, can on the side of a pole. It's a transformer, probably a quite large one. And it usually hangs from a top hook. And then the bottom hook is just a, a fastener just to kind of keep it on the pole, but it looks like it broke from the pole. Uh, the next one just showing some buildings, just disheveled. 
These poles, I think these are 50 to 65 foot poles that are all just kind of wrecked and hanging there. And this is, I thought this initially was like a dock, this one here with the water. I think that's a parking lot. So it's actually the edge of the parking lot. And that pole's got uh, probably a three phase bank. And if you look at the transformers, one's covers off. So all the oil's leaked out of that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's kind of what they're walking in with the water and the, the mud and the grossness. They said all the sewage and stuff is in the streets and in the dirt. And the, they said it just smells really bad. Yeah. And then the last picture in the grouping is this is our guys. Um, they must have given them a, a trailer to use, auxiliary trailer to pull with them. They actually they brought a pole trailer with them. So the way it works is the back of the trailer <coughs> clamps the, the fat part of the pole, and the front of the trailer is, is a tongue. You actually They actually fasten it with lag bolts. Um, and that hooks onto the truck. The pole actually becomes the trailer. Um, and then these other two, this one here, the white truck, extended all the way up with the, with the claws on it. That's our digger that went down. That's 97E. I'm not sure who the other truck is. And this, this is the picture from the um, North Bolt the, the day that above the North Bolt, Norwich Public Utilities. That's down there. Um, that's pretty much what they're doing. So the, what I've understood is that they're trying to salvage some of that wire. But it's not. It's just not fun, and the, and the supplies, I guess, are, are a little more limited than they thought they would be. Um, so right now, the plan is they're trying to get more crews for this Sunday to go now. We've we've offered two more line guys, and our bucket truck, which is our, our oldest one, um, they're expecting to have those back sometime after Christmas. So it's 72E. We were trading it in, and then we bought it back from the, um, the trading company, I think Kylie. And um, I'm actually going November 2nd. I'm replacing Brian Roach as manager down there. And then our change-out crew is wave two, which we scheduled back um, in October, early October, are going down November 6th. So their, their planes have been booked, et cetera. So the other crews, they'll go down and land, I guess, an hour later. The other crews will get on the plane and come back. Mm -hmm. um, so we're planning on doing that in a couple weeks. So to address a couple of things that you may have questions on, because we've talked about this amongst ourselves, uh, this is all being funded uh, by FEMA through NEPA. So we are being funded. We gave them a quote, and they're going to fund it all. And, and so that's where the funding goes. But this is a very important project. We are sending another crew down there. So another question would be, what is that doing to the current crews? The current crews are still very busy. They have a lot of work going on. But historically, this time of the year, work tends to taper off a little bit. So we're able to do it. So we're still able to do the work here and to provide humanitarian efforts down in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And that is an absolutely great thing that the utility is able to do. It is, there are other uh, local municipalities that are helping, but uh, it is tremendous that we're able to do this. So I wanted to give you guys an update on what the utility is doing. Councilor Heath. So how do we uh, figure out you know, we can participate and FEMA is going to pay for it. Does FEMA approach the city we, or, or the we, utility company? Well, this was all done well in advance. Mm -hmm. Not well in advance, but it was done because it was a pretty quick turnaround for you Right, guys. so the U.S. Virgin Islands actually contacts NEPA. They're a municipal utility themselves. They reach out to municipal utilities, and then NEPA answered the call and said, we are willing to try to help you. Um, WAPA will, will send the contracts, et cetera. The, they're reviewed by NEPA. NEPA works with FEMA to, to get costing understood and, and agreed to, and then WAPA essentially works on that as well. So WAPA is the um, Water and Power Authority on St. Thomas, and they work with uh, FEMA to get the coverage, which I believe is up to 90% because they waited the 30 days. So they agree on the contract pricing that NEPA gave them, and then they essentially lock it in as a contract. So that's the understanding. So in the end, we, utility, should not incur any cost where everything's going to be covered. All supplies, all personnel, all time, all overtime, all the trucks, everything. Insurance, we, we made sure that workman's comp was going to be carried in the event that heaven help, help and help us said something happened to our employees, but that was one of the things that we had to make sure was that we're going to have workman's comp coverage, uh, but everything is covered, and once they get back, it should be as if they never left. So there's no risk to us. Councilor Rusk. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to everybody who went to work, every family, because it impacts them also. Um, 
my question though is if we have some sort of disaster how does that impact us I, I mean if we have a hurricane if so I've uh, I've been on the phone with John Bilda through Ron and he's the he's the um, general manager he's the top manager at Norwich Public Utilities mm -hmm. we're actually supposed to meet tomorrow to talk about local mutual aid so an agreement between us that says if they have an issue we can help cover them and if we have an issue they help cover us so they've got I don't know their total crew numbers we have 15 linemen one's on workman's comp right now uh, three are down in the Virgin Islands two more will go we'll still have on uh, roughly seven qualified and two apprentice um, and then Norwich has this has roughly the same probably five to seven so we've got one digger and three line trucks. They've got one digger and two or three line trucks. So we can certainly back each other up. So we're we're getting ready to talk. We're going to talk about that. He was he was a little nervous. I think we're sized very well normally um, for disasters, et cetera. If something bigger hits, then mm -hmm. certainly we need extra help. So they're 15, 20 minutes away. Okay. So we're going to try and work on some some kind of mutual aid agreement just between the two of us. So good, that good question. Because what happens if you have an emergency when you're helping somebody else? Right. 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 Uh, it, just as a follow-up, I know yeah. after Superstorm Sand, it was so nice to see all those trucks coming in. So, right. you know, right. thank you for You're reciprocating. Yes. Councilor Reed? No, she already it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, we can pull. Yeah, yeah, we can pull our, our people at any point. We've signed a contract, okay. but they certainly recognize the fact that if we had an emergency back here and we need to bring our crews back, we could do that. Okay. Is that all vol um, volunteer? So, um, it's volunteer as far as the utilities volunteering to NEPA. So, yes. So, uh, some of the crews didn't go, like Wallingford, Wallingford did not, they did not respond quick enough the first time. They were at the very bottom of the list. Yeah. Um, but certainly, if we didn't want to go, we said, we said no. Our guys. And our linemen, our guys. Yeah. Yeah. every our one guys of our guys that are down there are all volunteers. Yeah, that's what I was The guys that are getting ready to go down there are all volunteers. Mm -hmm. we, I was very surprised. I was pleasantly surprised when I sat in the room that morning. It was about, I think I came in at 5 a.m. to meet with the whole crew because they were all excited and, and nervous about it and wanted to know and we had actually had a mutual aid call two weeks before and we said no because we didn't we thought it was going to come up the coastline which it came we got some we got the microburst right mm -hmm. I think that might have been res residue from that um, we said no to that in anticipation that it would still come up the shore um, they were very mad and when I asked the group we asked the group who was interested every single person raised their hand so that I didn't think I did not anticipate that at all which was Awesome. This, this is something that we used to do routinely. Yeah, it's good uh, it is, it, definitely. This is something we used to do routinely. And then there was a period of time when we uh, decided we weren't, we was not in our best interest at the time to not to do it. And then this is the first time we've done it in a couple of years. And it looks like it's going to be a great thing. So we look forward to what the future brings. So it was a lot of work to get to the point where we actually decided who we we're going to send, and we actually send the guys down. That that took cooperation from everyone, from finance, from the mayor, from Ron, the director, everybody in the department chipped in. We had about 17 people probably in total reviewing contracts, getting paperwork done, signing stuff off, getting materials, getting the truck stock, getting you know coolers, right. et cetera, bug spray, suntan lotion, everything. And right. We're still the coming team, up with things. The team That's behind right. the team. That <laughs> and the and. Those are the men and women that made this happen, and we'll be talking more about that later, but uh, the team behind the team were tremendous in making this happen. Plus, we had to get shots, and, and all, I mean, there's just a lot. You don't just say, hey, guess what? We're going out on Virgin Islands tomorrow. <laughs> it, there's a lot of prep work that has to be done in a very short period of time in order to, to meet this, uh, recommend, this requirement. Anything else for Randy? Uh, Go ahead, Councilor how, how long do we anticipate, I guess, probably this uh, So FEMA project. actually asked for the extra crews because they want to get, the, I guess the U.S. Virgin Islands, WAPA is hoping they can get everything on by Thanksgiving. The guy, Our guys that are down there said, no way. <laughs> just because they, they see the devastation. It's just, yeah. it, the roads are horrible. The trucks are getting stuck. They're, they are Norwich broken axle, which you probably saw on the paper. Mm -hmm. They ended up, the tow truck that towed them, to a local station or whatever had the same axle so they took the axle off the tow truck and put it on the Norwich truck so it's it's rough terrain it's got stuff's getting stuck it's it's just it's hard working condition so um, our guys said they anticipate after Christmas um, I don't we don't know at this point like I said we the next crew the first crew went down uh, took them a week to travel they were supposed to be there two weeks they extended at the three the next crew will go it's supposed to go three weeks and then the interim crew were I think three to four weeks so we're not really sure at this time but they said they could probably use another 200 guys down there. At least. So, at least. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. And we don't know if it's going to go from here to St. Croix to St. John's to maybe Puerto Rico if, right. if we extend that. So 
Oh, we're ready. We're eager and anxious. Okay. Anything else for Randy? All right. That's it. Thank you, Randy. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Did uh, you guys get something in the packet from Firefighter Ray Hart? Did you guys mm, get anything? No. On C-59? Okay. What you may not know is that before we sent this crew, we had uh, Firefighter Ray Hart went down to Puerto Rico as part of an emergency response and search and rescue. And he sent a letter back after he got back. He said this letter is on October 4th. I have returned from Puerto Rico after being activated and deployed to assist those folks who were affected by the devastating, devastating Hurricane Marie. I want to thank you, the chief, and the city for the support I received. I've been training and bettering myself for over 16 years for just this type of emergency. The city, as always, is my primary responsibility. I am, I am fortunate to have a terrific employer, the city of Groton, that has agreed to the possibility of activation. An understanding of agreement was made between FEMA, Massachusetts Urban Search and Rescue, MATF-1, and the city of Groton. This cooperation is what allowed these teams to exist and get out there to help those in their time of need. I can't thank you enough for the support shown. The honor of Puerto Rico, as everyone has seen, was in the direct path of a major Cat 5 hurricane. The storm spent 10 or more hours ravaging the island, causing damage in every part of the island. No area was spared damage or complete destruction. Our team was flown to Puerto Rico by U.S. Air Force C-17 and the Air Force Reserve of New York and Massachusetts. We had a large job upon arrival. I was part of a seven, of a 22, correction, part of a 27-man team, one of eight sent to Puerto Rico to perform search and rescue missions. FEMA announced on the day we were demobilized that the team had, co had covered approximately 93% of the island and performed over 825 rescues and assistance to residents on the island. Our team and I were responsible for the western part of the island. This area received much of the brunt of the storm. Heavy rains and strong winds decimated as part of the island. Many homes were either damaged or wiped of the land completely. Rainfall in the area in the mountain region caused catastrophic mudslides and flash floods in this area as well. Many villages were washed away. During our missions for search and rescue, we also provided food and water to the residents. As you know, the island of Puerto Rico lost most of its electrical grid. Wires and poles damaged are completely gone. There was no phone service, internet, or electricity for the majority of the island's residents. FEMA and the urban search and rescue teams carry satellite phones in the field for our primary communications back to our base. But these phones, but these phones were one of the best things we could carry into the disaster area. We offered the local residents a chance to make calls to loved ones and tell those back in the United States of America they were alive and well. All in all, the experience and the chance to help my fellow man in time of need is something I'll keep with me for the rest of my life. I have many photos and more coming from the team once they've been reviewed and released for the public that I can share with you in the city of Grant. There will also be some paperwork coming and if you need it or have questions, I can get in touch with you with the person who can walk you through it. Again, thank you so much for the excellent opportunity shown. Respectfully, her, yours, Raymond Hart. So those are the two, two types of humanitarian and effort and mutual aid that the city has recently responded. So that's great. All right. The next item is item number one. This is appointments. The, if you remember from previous discussions, we talked about SB4, Senate Bill 4, which is now PA 17 tax 73, which refers to CMEC. We, pat, we uh, drafted, read the first, and then the final approval of the ordinance. And then the one part of the ordinance that we had not completed was to assign a ratepayer representative. I have talked to several people, and then I talked to the Utilities Commission. And uh, Mark Hoffinger is the person that I am recommending to you as a ratepayer representative. I think most, if not all of you, have had uh, interaction with Mark before, have worked with Mark. Mark's a previous town manager. And uh, I talked to Mark about he's basically breaking new ground 
because the ratepayers, this is a, a, a new position that was created by the law. And if you look at everyone else, we are, although we did not meet the one October deadline for the ratepayer representative, we are probably anywhere from three to six months ahead of everybody else. Most everyone else, uh, most all the other municipal, or correction, utilities and, and, and municipal owners do not even have their ordinances passed. So we're ahead of that. And uh, I thought, like I said, I talked to Mark, the CMEC has been talking to the state and has been talking to the legislature about what the purpose of the ratepayer is and how they're going to bring them in. And the ratepayer is going to be a voting board member, just like the other board members. Uh, and they will go in. And I think Mark has the uh, business acumen, and I think he has the personality that will help soften any concerns that people may have regarding what the ratepayer may or may not be. So with that, I bring to you uh, Mark Hoffinger as the as my recommendation for your ratepayer representative. He, he doesn't work for the city, he doesn't work for the municipality, he doesn't work for another municipality, he doesn't work for another, another uh, utility. So he meets those requirements. Any discussion? Councilor Heath? I can tell you how happy I was to see his name on, on the list. Mm -hmm. This is a slam dunk, and I, I think it's excellent. Okay. Councilor Shifton? Okay. We'll go in just a moment. Yeah, we'll get that in just a second. You well, have a, this, and this position is non paid. This is a. Well, it, what's the. The way the ordinance is written is it gives him the, it gives him the option of either being paid or not being paid and return the money back. My recommendation to Mark is since this takes a lot of time and he is a special thing is, is to take is to take the stipend that comes out of CMEC, which is six hundred dollars a meeting. But there's a lot of work to go into the meetings. The meetings the meetings are typically two to four hours plus plus prep work. The book that you get in preparation for the meeting is about a half inch to an inch thick that you need to go through and understand the financials. It's paid by CMAC. Right? It's paid by CMAC. It's not no cost now. To us. It's no cost to us. However, it is. I want to. I need to be very clear. It's like saying when we get money from the state, it's not taxpayer money. It's still taxpayer money when we get it from the state. This is ratepayer money that comes out of CMAC. Now, uh, well, we have Commissioner have God, uh, Godley mm -hmm. has decided not to take the money, and that money, his money goes to uh, energy assistance. But, but if I understand it, under this new law, mm -hmm. we have to have somebody. Well, we have to have somebody, and what it, what it says is the municipality. Uh, has to define what the payment's going to be and whether the payment's going to be from CMEC or whether the payment's going to be from the utility. What we did was we, we referred back to CMEC's, uh, I don't remember if I referred back to the bylaws or what it was, but that way CMEC would pay for the money. We've already talked to CMEC. That way it doesn't come out of our funds. But, but the point I'm trying to get at is we're really not talking about money tonight because right. we have to have somebody. Right. And do we want Mark Offinger or somebody else? Right. And I, I would make a motion to remove his name uh, to the next council meeting okay. so that we can vote on it. I'll second uh, that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank okay, you. the next item. Up for bid. Yes. The next item is 657. This is the contract with Peter Torello for sidewalk footing and cement cap and front landing. 657. Let me get to that. If you've noticed out front, you'll see some caution tape 
and some uh, combs identifying an area that is the area that we're going to be working on. One of the challenges we have is we have granite steps which get slick in the wintertime. So we put down ice melt and de-icer and those kind of things and so that they're not slick so that we try to minimize slip strips and falls. Challenge with that is that the de-icer that we're using and not, we're, we are looking at alternatives but it ends up uh, eating away at the cement and the uh, aluminum foundations of the doors. So because you can go out there and you can see where it's botched, that's called scaling, I think. And that's where what happens is the, the concrete, concrete thaws and freezes and thaws and freezes and causes it to start to get that mottled look and actually starts to chip away and erode away from the concrete. And that's just part of the deal. We're also, I'm also looking at something at some other options, but right now this is the best that we have uh, with the money that we have. Uh, there's some other things that I found out about, but they are fairly expensive. One of the things that, that I've talked to somebody about, and we haven't even begun to look at this yet, is that that upper area is to cut that out, put heaters underneath, and then concrete over top of that. We are nowhere near that. But that may come three or four or five years down the road, depending on how this uh, concrete lasts. And so with that, Ron, I'll let you talk about the financing. With the funding this would come from a um, bond reauthorization from the 2013 bond issue, uh, at your, your uh, spots tonight, but kind of where it stands, this was a follow-up to last week as well, as far as the presentation estimates that we had for what we went to the um, premium with what we thought we were going to do. But to keep in mind that that reauthorization was for municipal building improvements right, as a whole, and not limited to just the things that we thought. Right, that's this document here that was on your desk, uh, on at your, uh, sorry at your seats because there was a question that came up I asked Ron to try to explain it I know he had talked Ron had talked to Councilor Russ last week but I wanted to put something down that we could all look at to help explain where the funding uh, funding sources were and where they are and what we've spent and what we have so I'm just kind of walk through this document pretty quick the first column it shows the presentation estimates which got us to the 400000 that was reauthorized, and again, it was for municipal building improvements as a whole. This next column is what council has authorized. We haven't actually spent the money, but we've approved to do to spend it. The major piece of this being the HVAC units at the 221000 and the fire alarm system for the 31560 The next column is what we've actually spent to date. Um, the rear exterior doors, the engineering for HVAC, and some um, funds on bathroom renovations, which are the, the new um, faucets or the sinks and the fixtures. We've started installing, but there's the plan is to continue that. And these are for the, the um, assets themselves. So that leaves the current available. So there's still 101,435 that has not been allocated or spent of that 400,000 at this point in time. This project that we have proposed for tonight, the steps, the top landing, the retaining wall on the side of the steps and that concrete slab come, came in at a proposal of 14650 which would still leave just under 87000 of additional funds for municipal building improvements. Did this go out to bid or is this? From my, my understanding on this, Tim, this was Tim's and unfortunately he couldn't be here tonight. Um, he reached out to at least five local vendors trying to get this project to come in as a whole. Nobody wanted to touch all the pieces of it. It was mm -hmm. some wanted would do one piece but didn't want the other piece. One would do one, not the other. So um, Trillo was the first group that actually came back and said, we'll do this whole project. It sounds like they're the only one interested in doing the project as a whole. Yeah. But I can get more information. Like I said, that mm -hmm. Tim unfortunately has that. And you know if there's any technical reason why or is it is it just the scale of it probably or 
I'm not sure, to be honest with you, what the, the reasoning for it was. One of them is the, that retaining wall along the side of the steps, which is brickwork, mm -hmm. and then the sidewalk is concrete. So I don't know if it's oh, because gotcha. of the two different, and I don't know if that was the reason or not. Or well, one of the things Tim mentioned to me is that a couple of the guys he talked to said it's just not big enough, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, it's not just patchwork. They're not just going in there and just going to do, you know, just patch over so it delaminates. They got to go in there and they got to cut it and they got to tie it in and, and those kind of things. But it's not a huge job. It's not right. twenty, right. thirty, forty thousand dollars. And most of them didn't want it because there's X amount of effort you got to put right. in, no matter what size job it is. Yeah. And they just didn't want to do that. Or that's what Tim relayed to me. That makes sense. Gotcha. Any other questions or comments on this? Thank you for the breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and in the future, we'll continue to do this so that you guys are aware of where the money is and what we're going to be spending it on. Or what we're recommending that you spend it on. Uh, with that, I need a motion to move this to the council meeting of 6 November. I'll make that motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, the last thing we have is 649 which is the review of the adopt a road program. Councilor Heat, I think you were looking at something, is that correct or no? Uh, to find out, the, um, there was a follow-up question about um, the background check mm -hmm. form. Right. And I spoke to the person actually by email because she's on vacation right now. Okay. She said basically every volunteer is required to fill out that form, but there's an additional single page form like half page that they also fill out um, much smaller um, but yes they do require every person because the, there's a liability issue apparently okay so all right is there any reason is there anything else is there anything holding this up from us issuing this I have no reason to hold it up. Okay. Now, this doesn't have to go to. Council. It's not an ordinance. It's just it's a policy. It's not an ordinance. It's just a policy. And, and we had reviewed that. And at a the council meeting. had already reviewed it. Just had a couple questions. Mm -hmm. And you guys had all, had agreed. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You can you can approve the policy as a resolution. So I'm going to have to go to Mayor Council on this. I would think so. We have other. Do we have other policies that we've? Usually, the policies we have affect only us within the building, the employees. Yep. I think that when we have a policy that's right. going to impact. The mm -hmm. Then let's let's do this. Let me get a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council, and then if I don't need to have a an ordinance on it, a then I have correction, a resolution on it, then we'll pull it. But mm -hmm. this way it allows us, this gives me the leeway of bringing it up to the Mayor and Council. So I'd like to have a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting of 6 November. Okay, we have a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Not related to the policy itself, but um, I think everybody probably wants to focus on Thames Street, but maybe we could come up with a list of why not Paquanic Road or why not, why not Mitchell if somebody mm -hmm. wants to do it and as I long agree. as they we, come to us. There are, a couple, there are, other there are areas a couple areas in attention. the city that would benefit from this. Yes, ma'am. Do, uh, do we need to be careful though of private property? Because I'm thinking like Mitchell, most of that area is private property. I think generally speaking, what you'd be picking up is what would be the sidewalk, the okay. corner of the street, you know, with our, whatever our city, um, if it's five, ten feet. Probably, probably probably be covered, uh, I mean, White obviously House. you don't want to go in someone's front yard. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> You're right. I can see where that could be problematic. You're right. Okay. Did we vote on this? No. We didn't vote. We had a motion and a second, right? Correct. Right. Right. Okay. Second. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. 
And let me double check to make sure I got X's on all my, or check marks on all my things to make sure we covered everything. Okay, it looks like we have covered everything that is on the agenda. I move we adjourn. Okay. Second. Need a second. We got a motion and a second. We are adjourned.